So earlier this week, I read a story about an old man who lived alone in the country. He wanted to dig his potato garden, but it was too laborious. And his best friend Fred used to help him, but Fred was in prison. The old man wrote a letter to his friend and described his circumstances. Dear Fred, I'm feeling pretty bad because it looks like I won't be able to plant my potato garden this year. I'm getting too old to be digging up garden plots, but if you were here, all my troubles would be over. I know you would dig the plots for me. Love, Tom. A few days later, Tom received a letter from Fred. Dear Tom, for heaven's sake, don't dig up the land. That's where I buried the bodies. At 4 a.m. the next morning, the FBI agents and local police came and they dug up that piece of the land and they didn't find any bodies and they apologized and they left. The same day, the old man received another letter from his friend. Dear Tom, go ahead and plant the potatoes now. That's the best I could do under these circumstances. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Kyle. I'm the student minister here. Uh, if you're joining us for the first time, welcome. If you could take a look at the row in front of you, you will find a Connect card, either physical or digital. Please fill that out. Let us know that you're here and how we can be praying for you. If you are not new here and you're returning, welcome. Uh, I just want to let you guys know real quick, uh, Happy New Year. 2022 is going to be a great year. I've decided through God's faithfulness and through long and arduous conversations with Micah, my wife, that 2022 is going to be my mullet year. Uh, I think every young man needs to go through a mullet year. Um, I'm going to grow my mullet. I'm not too sure how Asian American individuals look like with a mullet, but we'll all find out come April. That's the plan. There's a student named Tanner. He and I have mapped out what my progress is supposed to look like, and we'll see what this mullet will look like come April. All right. So I just wanted to make sure and uh, establish that covenant with you guys as my family. It was Henry Ford who said, coming together is a beginning, keeping together is progress, and working together is success. Our conversation this morning will be through the book of Nehemiah, starting in chapter 3. And so while we get there, let me give you some context. Nehemiah is an Israelite official serving in the Persian government. And when he hears about the state of Jerusalem's walls, he prays, then he goes and seeks permission from the Persian king Artaxerxes to go and rebuild that wall. The king grants him leave along with an armed escort and some resources for the wall. And it was time for Nehemiah to get his hands dirty. And he knew that. The story of Nehemiah is about a man who ached for his community. And he sought to rebuild and to restore hope for his people. So when it's time for us to get our hands dirty, how do we respond? The strength of the wall is only as strong as the people who built it. Several years ago, my friends and I were putting together a puzzle. In case you didn't know, I'm kind of the black belt equivalent when it comes to puzzles. Uh, my father-in-law and the rest of the family might disagree because I never do puzzles with them because they do it wrong. Um, but anyhow, we were plugging away at this puzzle, and we finally get down to the last five spots. And we notice that we are missing two puzzle pieces. And so we're checking the table, nothing. I'm moving chairs, I'm looking under my feet, I check underneath the table, underneath the cloth, and there she was, the crystal blue that united the Atlantic Ocean. The last piece was really important, too. That held the boot of Italy. And without this piece, the picture was incomplete. So I'm looking under chairs again. I'm looking through the couches. I'm playing detective, going through pockets, going through hats, whatever. I couldn't find it. And my friend was about to give up. And uh, I'm still playing detective, of course. And he opens the box, and he shouts, hey, Kyle, here it is. And there she was, the home of pizza and pasta. And we place that picture, and I don't know about you guys, but there's a certain type of satisfaction that comes when you place that last piece of the puzzle and then quickly destroy it and put it back into the box. There's just something about building something up and then disregarding all your efforts. I don't know. But the picture, nonetheless, was complete. Everything was the way it was supposed to be. And when it comes to God and his church, in order for the picture of his church to be complete, he puts us pieces in his masterpiece, the church, together. But what does it take? It takes all of us doing our part, doing our task, so that we can be the image that God originally designed the church to look like. If some of us aren't doing the job that we were called to do, then the picture is incomplete. It takes all of us doing our part, because all of us are part of the picture. But some of us aren't using the gifts that God has blessed us to accomplish the things for the kingdom. The church as a whole, if we're not doing our part, then the picture is incomplete. So what does this mean? 
how do we play our part? We play our part by serving, by getting our hands dirty, by using the gifts that God has given us. By serving, we create the picture of what God designed us to be. Maybe we can relate to the puzzle piece that was on the floor. Because some of us are kind of just there, and we don't really do much. And maybe we don't really want to do anything. But I want to remind you, while we don't do anything, the picture remains incomplete. Or maybe some of us can relate to the puzzle piece that was in the box. And we all know what this box is. It's that safe place where there are no expectations, no stress, no tough conversations, nothing. So when it comes to serving, we like to just sit in the safe place. And unfortunately, while we sit there, the picture remains incomplete. So when the call is to rise up, when the call is to serve, when the call is to build, what do we do? How did the people who are working with Nehemiah respond? Let's start in chapter 3, starting in verse 1. The high priest, Eliashib, and his fellow priests began rebuilding the sheep gate. They dedicated it and installed its doors. After building the wall to the Tower of the Hundred and the Tower of Ananel, they dedicated it. The men of Jericho built next to Eliashib and next to Zachar, son of Imri, built. To save us time and me embarrassment, the rest of chapter 3 is a bunch of complicated names from a lot of complicated places all coming together. All right? All kinds of people groups come together to one region to rebuild parts of the wall. Nehemiah 3 is important because it shows us that despite any difference, once upon a time, a bunch of people came together because they recognized the importance of the city of Jerusalem. And as the city lay in ruins, the picture was incomplete. And the people recognized that. After all, the strength of an ancient city was in their walls. So how do the people respond? What do people do when it's time to rise up? People get to work. And that's what happened. Everyone went to work. Everyone was different, but still got to work. In fact, we read about the Levites who got together with the people from Kyla. And these people were drastically different. The high priest and the people from Kyla had nothing in common. Everyone was needed in order to accomplish the task. So when the kingdom call is to serve, it doesn't matter what you do, who you are, or what you've done, the point of serving isn't about any of those things. It's not even about you or me. The moment that we get to the point where we think that we're above a task, we lose sight of the Jesus that we're following. The moment we think we're too good for something, the moment we think we're above any task, like sweeping the floor or cleaning the toilets, the moment we believe we're above a task is the moment that we lose sight of the Jesus we're following. Everyone has a place. Everyone plays a part. Everyone has a role. And you might not be the event organizer, but you might be the person who bakes the cake for the event. And you might not be the person who baked the cake for the event, but you might be the person who stays and cleans it up. Or maybe you might be the person who carries all the boxes. Or maybe the person who's been blessed to be able to help make that event run smoother. Everyone plays a part and there is no job that is more important than the other. So in order for the picture to be complete, it takes each and every one of us doing our part, living out the task that God has called us to. It takes each of us serving. There's a study conducted by a group called Barna, and this Barna group has gone to all kinds of churches in the United States and globally as part of their new plan for these next set of years. And they go to all kinds of churches, small, medium, large, city, rural, rustic, whatever, Regardless, the statistic remains the same. They found that 10% of the people in the church do 90% of the work and the giving. 10% of the people in the church do 90% of the work and the giving. What I wonder is, what would it look like if all hands were on deck? Imagine what it would look like if, as a church, we never assumed that it was someone else's responsibility. What if What if we could imagine that no one would assume it was someone else's responsibility? Imagine if no one responded, oh, I'm sure someone else is going to pick up these chairs or someone else will sweep this floor. Imagine if there was one job and 14 people in line to do it instead of 14 jobs and one person in line to do it. Imagine if all hands were on deck. Imagine if the thing you were going to get done today was already done. You'd probably say, wow, I'm able to move on to the next thing. If the statisticians were to walk into our church and to run their tests, would you be in the 10% or would you be in the 90%? Are you in the 10% of the people doing 
or in the 90% of people who are watching? Maybe a better question is to ask this. Am I a burden to someone, or do I help relieve the burden of someone? When we refuse to serve, when we refuse to get our hands dirty, we give others a warped view of Jesus. After all, Jesus' mission statement is stated this way in Matthew 20, verse 28. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. I want to appoint our attention to the first section of this verse, because we're talking about getting our hands dirty and getting, uh, our, getting our all hands on deck. What would it look like if this church, if we as a people group, decided to jump in fully all hands on deck? All hands holding up a piece of the wall. We each build what we were called to build. Paul, who was writing to the church of Ephesus, who was struggling with their identity and who they were going to be as a church, wrote this in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through 8. But to each of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when we ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Paul tells us in that context, we will grow into the mature picture of Christ, the mature picture of who God has designed for us to be, when each of us do our part, when we all step in, when we're all holding a piece of the wall. So our truth this morning is the act of serving is the action of Jesus. Jesus came into this world. Why? To serve others. And that's the point, to serve others help others, and to make a way for us to come back to him. When it comes to the topic of serving, I think if we're being honest, one of the quickest things we tend to do is think of reasons why we can't. We're too busy. Maybe we've never done that. We don't know how to do it. Our schedules are just too full, or I don't have enough, whatever. But the act of serving is the action of Jesus. One of my professors always said, if you're not dead, you're not done. If we can walk, we can work. It's not, our, it's not someone else's job to serve other people, to restore hope, and to bring restoration back to a community. Let me illustrate it this way. This woman that I'm going to show you on the screen, this woman's name is Agathia. And at the start of World War II, her dad, who was a believer of Jesus, didn't like the direction that the world was headed in. So he picked up his family, and they all moved 3,000 miles away to the Siberian tundra, one of the most desolate, desolate places on the world. He wanted to insulate and isolate his kids from the negative influences of the world. Sadly, this woman's parents died a few years after moving to the Siberian tundra. And then her siblings died. And so she was left with a question, do I stay or do I go? She stayed. She wakes up every morning, she reads her Bible, she prays, she hunts and fishes, and she splits her wood. And there's a part of that that I think that some of us, if not all of us, can romanticize. And it's almost as if that sounds idealistic on some level, because of the direction that our culture is headed. But I think she's wrong in how she's choosing to spend her time, and here's why. She has received love from her Heavenly Father, and what has she done with it? She's chosen to keep it to herself, whereas keeping God's love to ourselves was never the point. Let me remind all of us that the mission of God never changes, to go and make disciples, to share the same love that we had encountered. But the methods by which we accomplish that, those things change. And you can count on this. Your sole purpose as a follower of Jesus is to wake up every day and receive love from the Father. And then you take that love from him. And you go and give that in some tangible way to someone else. Now, there's one detail in chapter 3 that we read earlier that I don't want us to miss. Together, we read the first two verses. And in my opinion, the first two verses set the stage for the context of the book of Nehemiah, but also that passage. The first two verses talk about the priests and their responsibility to rebuild the sheep gate. Their responsibility was to rebuild the sheep gate. In the wall, there were a bunch of different gates with a bunch of different responsibilities. And as we read through chapter 3, we get to see that. We see different people rebuilding different sections of the wall. And the priests, in the first two verses, rebuilt the sheep gate. The interesting part that you don't get just by glancing through chapter 3 is that the sheep gate was the first gate mentioned. And why is that? 
historically, the sheep would come through this gate into the city of Jerusalem for a reason. The gate was built so that the priest could go safely into the night to find the sheep or the lamb that was needed for sacrifice for the next day for those people in order to pardon the sins of that community. So the sheep gate was the first part of the wall that was rebuilt. In other words, the first thing that was rebuilt was the portion of the wall that opened the door for people to come to God. The sheep gate was a vital part of the process in which restoration could be achieved. The first place that was built was the place that allowed people to come to God. There are some of us that might want to try and get our hands dirty and to go out and to serve, and that's great. But as we look forward to 2022, what I would ask, my question is, before we start rebuilding the rest of the wall by serving, have we repaired our sheep gate? What does the sheep gate look like in your life? Before we're going out to go and serve, what does your sheep gate look like? How does the door that gets you to your relationship with Jesus look like? We're going to enter into our time of communion in just a moment. And during this time, I'd like you to think about your sheep gate. For us, it's not a gate where a lamb walks through and there's a sacrifice over a fire. For us, it's God's son who walked up a hill and hung on a cross. And instead of being on top of fire and being offered as a, as a sacrifice, he hung. And why? Because his actions were service, even to the point of dying on a cross. This was serving you and serving me to restore hope, to restore brokenness and repair it, to bring back freedom to a city and his children. So before we go and can serve others, we have to repair the road that leads back to Jesus. And when we do, our hands better be ready to get dirty. After we have restored that road, after we have surrendered our lives in baptism, we need to be ready to get our hands dirty because the picture would remain incomplete. When the call is to rise up and to serve, and we don't, the picture is incomplete. So my question this morning is, if the act of Jesus is the act of serving, what are we saying with our actions? Are we telling the story of Jesus, or are we passing on some warped view or warped story? What are we saying with our actions? Are we like the piece that's under the table, just not doing anything? Or are we like the piece that's in the box, not moving, too afraid to do anything, while the picture remains incomplete. Before we can serve others, we have to repair the road to Jesus. Once that is done, our hands better get dirty because the act of serving is the act of Jesus. 2022 is going to be one of the best years here at SEC. I truly believe that. I'm going to have a mullet. You guys are going to love it. It's going to look great. We have so many service opportunities along with events. And these events, we're not only going to be able to give back to the community, but we're going to be able to interact with them. Unlike, um, unlike the woman that we talked about earlier, when we take love from God, it's not about keeping it to ourselves. It's about giving it over to someone else as well. If someone never gave it to you, where would you be in your life? I think we all agree with this statement. We want more people at the table than we do away from it. And so where are you at with your sheep gate? What does it look like in your relationship with God? And after you've answered those questions, what part of the wall do you need to start holding up? What part of the wall belongs to you and your people? Who's your group and where do you belong on that wall? I hope 2021 went well. And if not, I pray that you reflect on 2021. I pray that you will look after your sheep gate, renew it and cherish it because 2022 is here and the calendar is full of opportunities to get our hands dirty. Let's pray.